Drew Hart. What's going on, my brother? What how you doing, man? I'm I'm great. I'm back in Wisconsin. <laughs> oh, okay. Back in Wisconsin. Now, now it's happening. Yeah. Well, well so, I'm back in Florida. So there you go. Yeah, that's right. It's uh we're doing the opposite. You're the snowbird and I'm the I don't know what it is. What is the inverse of a snowbird when someone goes to the colder the, part? Uh, you're the west bird, east bird. West yeah. east bird. Yeah. I don't know what you are. I don't even know if there are any birds who go that way. <laughs> Nothing wants to move to the cold. Nothing does. There's no animal on earth that does want that wants to do that. <laughs> I, I guess you're right, man. I guess you're right. Well, it's been it's just been like crazy times in Amazon, man. I um just on the Amazon news front, I want to talk about this. Um, let me share my screen. Um, I think I had the screen up, and then I lost it. So maybe I won't share my screen, but I'll tell you what I read. <laughs> I'll tell you what I read. So Amazon, oh, here it is. I, I'm, it's just like a little Google. It's my little Google page here. Amazon, this is August 9th. Amazon's rolling out an artificial intelligence tool for sellers on its marketplace that will write copy for product listings. What do you think about this, Drew? I've got, two, there's two sides of the coin right, with any listing. And then the one is that you're optimizing it for the uh, algorithm and the other ones you're optimizing it for sellers to actually buy shit. So yeah. what are they doing it for? Which one are they doing it for? Um, and then the other piece is, you know, we've been working with a lot of AI tools ourselves internally, right? For a lot of different uh, use cases. They're good, but they really just get you a solid draft. So I think it's going to be net positive. My take on it is it's going to get sellers who don't feel like they understand the process to develop the content for their listings, whether it's for the A9 or a shopper. And it'll get them 80% there, but they got to take it that extra 20%. And it's that extra 20% that's going to differentiate uh, winners and losers on Amazon. So still human. So to summarize it, you still got to finish it. You still got to make sure you're selling enough. Your, your, your unique propositions are in there. It's not all just keywords. Uh, you have to police it, but it does help. It does give you a leg up. Get you a yeah, I think. I think so. And then the other thing is you got to answer asking your questions like does Amazon under, does Amazon actually understand like especially for some of these more niche products, not the commodities like yeah. you start looking at like some of the new beauty products and new supplements that are coming out, you know, how much does Amazon's algorithm really understand uh, how to connect the listing to the shopper search term, right? Shopper intent. And That's that, but theirs is based the, on their data. Their AI model is based on shoppers' intent, so it might be good. Like they, they, they're they're cataloging millions and millions of searches every single day. So we'll see, we'll see. We'll see. I, I hear you. Like, the, like think the, I think that's the argument, right? Like the intuition is, well, Amazon's got all the data. They're the source of the data, and no so then therefore, does. then therefore, they're going to be really, really good at this. But they yeah. have to execute well on it. You, they can have all of the data mining and, and data resources that available to them, but if they don't do an excellent job of actually making that connect, we'll find out. I think people will start, you know, there'll be people that will want to run A-B tests, right? Where they'll run with Amazon's recommendations and then they'll run with the one that's, you know, driven by some third party software, right? Like Data Dive or any one of those other ones. And yeah. uh, and they'll, they'll do the Pepsi challenge and we'll see how it goes. Well, what I've learned, no software has replaced uh, a human being yet on Amazon, and you and I, Drew, still have a job. There has not yep. been a PPC software. There has not been. They have made things more efficient, but you still need expertise, and you still need good old fashioned marketing sense. And that's why you and I have a job. So that's good. We're we're super pro AI. Um, it's yeah. helped our teams do more in less time, yeah. um, and get better results. So faster and better is basically uh, the, the bottom line and i i'm i'm a big fan of it it was scary at first but i don't think it's scary anymore well who knows we we might get to the point where someone goes back in time to kill john connor but i don't know if that's you know if that's gonna happen <laughs> yeah. we'll find out. all of a sudden like, uh, yeah <laughs> we'll fine. find out all right well i'm excited about today because we got a guy on coming on who's in the uh he's in the barbecue business uh, his name is devin and he built a brand with his wife uh like everybody else on a shoestring budget so I'm, I'm pumped about talking to this guy i think he's going to add some value to the audience yeah 
what I like about Devin is um, he's got a really he's got a really cool background, right? He's got this financial background, so I'll be interested in uh, hearing his thoughts on, you know, how you know more recently since um, since like COVID, where things were just gangbusters. Um, yeah, you know how, how things changed and what's he doing to sort of manage the change. So yeah. Well, awesome. Without a further ado, um, that's French for let's fucking go. Welcome to the YouTube pod, whatever I want to call this. Welcome aboard. And really excited to have you. And I'm really happy that you uh, graciously accepted my, our invitation to be oh, here. Yeah. Today. And uh, the fact that you're, you're an open book is really helpful and awesome. And let's just start with the origin story. So uh, what was the uh, what was Devin doing prior to Amazon? And how, how did you get into Amazon in the first place? Yeah. Yeah. So my background was finance and accounting. Um, you know, I always wanted to, to like own my own business and had tried different things throughout the years, but you know, I went to school, got my CPA exam and I was working in public accounting for a while, uh, you know, doing audit work. And then, um, you know, kind of transitioned into like financial reporting and some consulting and stuff like that. But, um, you know, basically at the time I was doing network marketing, not very well because you know i wasn't very strong at the uh, the networking side of it um but my my brother-in-law you know actually told me about amazing selling machine and i watched the videos on that and initially my my goal was just you know start to build a business to generate enough income you know to leave my day job and focus on my network marketing business um and then i slowly learned that i was way better at e-commerce than network marketing and so, um, you know, kind of went, you know, full time into e-commerce back in, uh, 2016. So we launched our brand in, uh, 2014 on our honeymoon. And then, um, you know, basically took about a year and a half, two years before I could transition to full time doing that. And, and l l let me guess $5,000 on a credit card or like, what's the, uh, what's the initial investment? Yeah, I mean, that was more or less like we, you know, we paid for the course on a card um, and, you know, not not saying that this is what I would recommend to everybody, but like as I was building our business, like I realized that this was going to be the thing. So, you know, I liquidated like my 401k, put that into inventory, um, you know, I mean, it was like I hadn't been working that long, so it wasn't like a ton of money, but it was like you know, Hey, here's some liquidity to, to build something that I can control rather than, you know, just having it sit in like various mutual funds that really aren't that great anyway. Yeah. Well, you believed in yourself. You really invested in yourself. A hundred percent. Yeah. yeah. And that's awesome. So, so, so your brand is, uh, what's the name of your brand that you have on Amazon? Uh, Grillaholics. Grillaholics. Uh, Freaking yep. love that name. Yeah. Uh, we sell uh, barbecue accessories and then uh, rubs and, uh, we're we're really focused on expanding on the consumables side, so uh, adding more rubs, getting into like sauces, brines, things like that. The Grillaholics name can go so many places. That's very smart. So what what um and then Drew, I promise I'll let you have it. I'll, I promise I'll give you a question. But um, what was the <laughs> what what was the angle with the grill? Like you know, some people would say don't do seasonal products. Some people would be like, you're dumb, don't do it. Why did you end up going there? <laughs> yeah, I mean, they're not necessarily wrong. You know, sell, having a seasonal brand is hard. There's yeah. a lot of times where, like, if I could go back and and start over, um, you know, maybe I would probably, I probably would have gotten into like a supplements brand, and you know, that's probably my my long term plan. Um, but you know, at the time, like, there was, I was just following the model, right? So um you know looking for opportunity and made my products list based on you know criteria at the time and there was a couple of barbecue products on there that i was like i like barbecue i like grilling you know growing up cooking with like my dad um it was always you know something i enjoyed and so i was like why don't we build a you know a barbecue brand and um so that was kind of how we we just jumped in and then you know stayed in that space um, but yeah, seasonality is very challenging, especially on Amazon, because, you know, when you try to play the Amazon game of like always focusing on ranking, um, you know, inevitably in the off season, like you kind of lose your ass cause you spend so much money and conversion rates just aren't nearly the same. 
Um, and so that's been an adjustment for us over the last few years. We kind of had to change our approach on that. Mm -hmm. Makes sense. You, did you want to tee one up, Drew? I just didn't want to. Yeah, sure. Uh, yeah, yeah. No, I wasn't sure if you're done asking grilling him, grilling him on uh, your with your questions. Good one. Hey. Uh, Good one. I got to. I got to. I had to get it in. I was waiting for my first opportunity to do it. Uh, yeah. Awesome. Um, yeah, it's really interesting. The seasonality is really interesting. Um, you know, one of the things that uh, you know, in advance of the call was this idea of you know the pressures that are getting in on Amazon dollars. Like in June of 2014, you were prime at 16. Man, there's just so much that's changed on Amazon. Um, and, you know, like what are your what are your thoughts on like the marketplace and competition and you know what are you doing to kind of address the new dynamics that are kind of happening? So I, I mean I think there's a lot of moving pieces, right? So like you know, obviously on you know products that are more commodity type things like you know a lot of these uh chinese companies where you know maybe they're the manufacturer directly or they have you know better access like they kind of eat you know people's lunch when it comes to more commoditized products right um so there's that aspect of things you know there's the rising costs aspect where you know amazon is raising their fba fees they're raising storage fees like you know, all those types of things are, are changing and increasing. Ad costs are increasing. Um, you know, goods in general are starting to kind of get more expensive too. And so like, well, what do you, what do you do about all that? Right. So, you know, for us, the big focus over the last, you know, year has really just been like, I'm not going to worry as much about trying to play like the ranking game or whatever and you know like spend a ridiculous amount of money on ads and all these types of things um you know we've been more focused on like making sure that we're maintaining profitability every single day um you know kind of like i had mentioned with the seasonality game like the way we used to do it was we would just spend like an obscene amount of money in the off season like basically lose money in the off season and then when we'd get to season you know we would sell like a ridiculous amount but like the goal was basically like get back to even then make profit and then you know so then you're losing again in the season after grilling season and then you know having a really awesome christmas to end out the year with a decent margin right and it was i don't know like i was just tired of playing it that way and so you know, now what we're doing is kind of focusing on like in the off season if we can run at like break even great and then you know we'll just crush during season and the holidays um and you know there's a lot of different ways we're kind of approaching that but you know just making sure that we're not letting our like our ppc costs just eat away all of our margins and how do you find that your ranking gets affected by that seasonality like right around march probably early april people are starting to go outside if you're not aggressive over the winter does it really affect how quickly you rank into the season? I think it can. So that's kind of the thing that we're trying to find the right balance for. But usually my thought process is like, well, let's ramp up, you know, say like the month before, right? Like right before season, we'll start going a little bit harder, you know, maybe try to do, you know, whether it's lightning deals or seven day deals to get that volume so that, you know, relevancy kind of increases going in. Um, and then, you know, just, focusing on maintaining high conversion rates so that, you know, we can do well through the season. Um, you know, but I, I feel like there's, there's so much volume and traffic and we have, you know, good listings. And so, you know, we can ramp up our ads when it, you know, gets close to season time. And usually that works pretty well for us. Smart. Makes sense. Yeah. I'm looking at your store right now. What was the first product you guys started with? Just curious. And, and, yeah. and even still on Amazon is it still selling. Yeah. Yeah. Our first product was like our, our nonstick grill mats. Um, you know, we launched, that was, uh, what we launched in 2014 and, um, yeah, like we still, you know, it still sells really well for us right here. Uh, yeah, the, uh, the two pack, but, um, we did come out with three, so it's up, uh, okay. I think it was up higher, but, um, okay. right here. Yep. So your first product on Amazon, when you knew 
probably jack shit compared to what you know today. Is this mm -hmm. same product that you're, is it, is it, would you call this your hero product or is it just? Um, so it's slipped a little bit. This is one of those ones where I was talking about kind of the idea of like commoditized products. So, you know, this one did really, really well for us for a really long time and it still does decent revenue. The problem is you have like these companies that'll come in where they're like, oh, you sell two for $20. I'm going to sell six for $12. <laughs> and it's kind of like, all right, well, you do that. I, you know, we're not going to play that game. Right. So, you know, we make sure to, um, you know, obviously have really high quality materials and things. And then, you know, we try to provide like an awesome customer experience um and that's really just our the way we focus on it and you know yeah i'm not gonna i'm not gonna maintain you know mass mass market volume by being like the lowest price like that's just not what we're trying to do um and so you know the the pivot for us has been like okay you know this product may may not um uh, you know last forever um, and that's why we're starting to kind of pivot into some of the consumables and things where, you know, they can really be like more unique and, um, you know, much harder to compete on. So, mm -hmm. so Devin, I want to kind of go back to this, um, you know, this cost piece that you're, you're talking about and all that makes sense, by the way, we hear that too, with our clients that we work with is that. You know, if I were to go back 18 months or two years ago, I don't think the conversation was really um, as narrowly focused on management around a low, a, a small bandwidth of round tacos, right? Mm -hmm. Like really just keeping it like really dialed in. Now it's much more dialed in. And that means that like, you know, where you spend money and, and, and the experiments, you know, that agencies run, I put that in error quotes because sometimes that's, that's just BS, but um that those things, um, th there's less money to go around for those types of things. What else are you looking at though? Cause like when we're talking with clients, we're, you know, we're also looking at other parts of the financial statement beyond advertising, um, things like, you know, shipments, containers, things like that. And I'm just wondering like, what else are you looking at? And, 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 and maybe it's logistics, maybe it's a conversation you're having with your manufacturer. I'm just be curious about that. Yeah. So, there's, yeah, a few, like we've definitely focused on like some of our operations and, you know, operating expenses. So that's been a big focus, you know, like reviewing our, our uh, financials on a monthly basis, you know, analyzing like on the software side, you know, everything that we're using, are we really using it? You know, making sure that we don't let subscriptions just, you know, continue for the sake of continuing. Um, the other piece that, um, has been a game changer for us, you know, since a lot of our volume is still on Amazon, like probably 90%. Um, you know, we are primarily using FBA for most fulfillment, right? Like we do use, uh, you know, deliver or flex port a little bit here and there. Um, but to kind of streamline our operations, we've started just using Amazon for most things. And um, we're using like the global logistics program. And honestly, like for anybody that hasn't tried it, it's a game changer in terms of margin. Like the amount I was paying for like a, you know, freight forwarder to move our stuff in the past compared to what I pay Amazon global logistics to move our stuff is, I mean, I'm, I'm probably paying like a third of what I used to. Wow. Um, and so I don't know. I mean, I know there's some people that like, they talk, they have horror stories about like, you know, some sort of mishap with Amazon. Uh, but we've had a pretty great experience. And usually the the timelines are not, you know, not really any different than anything else I've been doing. Um, and we save so much money because I don't think they're, it's not like they're trying to have a ton of margin on that program, right? Like they're trying to get volumes. So I think they're giving basically close to cost. And so, you know, you can move um stuff for really an expensive amount of money what's the name yeah. of the program just so i can highlight that it's yeah so it's it's amazon global logistics okay. um and you know i can't recommend enough like you know so i do i uh i work with amazing and and coach a lot of people through amazing and you know i'm always telling our members like you should try it because it will save you money um what's the go ahead brian or yeah, sorry yeah 
I was just verifying this is the right website. Uh, yep. Okay, yep. so we got sell.amazon.com, and then there's um, I'll just put the URL in the YouTube channel and in the pod. Okay, great, thanks, Devin. Yeah, awesome. so they have like an application process, but it basically ends up connecting to your Seller Central account, and so then when you book your shipping plan, you can put in like the ship from address is like your manufacturer in China. Awesome. Um, and then it'll give you an option to choose Amazon Global Logistics as like the end to end you know solution. Um, and so they'll either you can have them either pick up at your supplier or you can have them pick up you know at the port. And you know, so if you have FOB pricing with your supplier, they get it to the port. Amazon takes care of the rest. Um, and yeah, it's been I mean, if if the place that you want your inventory is Amazon, it makes you know a ton of sense and we're actually getting ready to test out the um uh what do they call it i think it's awd like the amazon warehouse distribution where they have kind of like the more long-term storage and then they'll they'll fill you into fba as well um and i think that's another opportunity for like cost savings on that side what are the trade-offs though Devin? like you know i heard you you said you know it sounds like it's a new program for amazon so they're kind of they're incentivizing people to kind of like join in so they can fill up the capacity yeah. in their their uh, containers and their ships. Um, any any inconveniences or anything to watch out for? Or any um, sort of like ask these questions before you decide? Yeah, so I mean, the only downside of using it is that like you can't put the inventory somewhere else, right? So, you know, it's at Amazon. You can't send it to, you know, Deliver or Walmart or, you know, a, a third party fulfillment company because it's sitting at Amazon. Um, but if, you know, if the main places you're selling is like say Amazon and Shopify, you really don't need anything else because you can sync your, you know, your multi-channel fulfillment with Amazon to your Shopify store and basically just run everything that way. So to me, it's a, a great way to streamline operations if you're, you know, only on a couple of channels. You know, once you start selling on Walmart, then you do, you know, have to figure out a, a different solution to get the inventory there. Um, but yeah, I mean, that's really the main thing. Otherwise, you know, I think, and I guess timing too, right? So for example, you know, we're, we're going into Q4. And so for us, you know, I wanted to make sure we were really on top of like getting our inventory in. Um, because I have had, you know, issues in the past where, you know, we've used L like Amazon's LTL close to the holidays and, you know, they'll either push it back or, you know, reroute it. And, you know, we've had issues with that. And so for us, what we ended up doing was saying like, okay, we'll ship like a batch of inventory uh, mid August and a batch of inventory mid September. And then that way there's, you know, enough time for it to get here, you know, ahead of black Friday. I also don't have to worry about, you know, cash flow issues because I, um, you know, did too much too early. So, you know, that's kind of the way we've managed that. Yeah, that's cool. Um, what was I going to ask next? Um, I've got like a host of questions over here on my other screen. Yeah. Um, I mean, I, one thing, one thing I guess too is like, so we talked about cutting costs, but the other side to focusing on profitability is like, how can you increase the revenue side too, right? So, um, you know, I think it's important for people to test raising prices. Um, you know, that was something like, you know, we've always been kind of like, oh, don't raise our prices because we'll lose volume, right? But you never really know until you try. And so, you know, a good example of this, we had a product that was selling really well, you know, last, uh, last holiday. And, um, you know, we would sell it for like $14.95 most of the time was kind of what we were doing. And, um, you know, inventory was starting to be low. So I bumped it up to 1695. It kept selling just as much, you know, I, by the end of the season, we were selling it at 1995 and had just way more margin on that product. So I think it's important for people to say, yes, you know, what can I do to reduce my costs, but also be willing to try, like, can I get more revenue on the same thing to add more to the bottom line? Yeah, makes sense. Yeah. Um, what are you seeing with, um, th this is a great segue into that, right? So like that one works, right? Your demand, you're, you're saying your demand didn't, didn't drop significantly <laughs> from the price increase. What about other like shopper behaviors that you're seeing? You know, you're kind of, uh, you're kind of in that market where it's like, it's a nice to have, it's not a need to have. 
kind of product. So what are you seeing in terms of uh, like customer direction, things related to like inflation and, you know, just people like just risk, you know, people are seeing like political risk with Ukraine and, you know, U.S. politics. What are, what are you seeing there? Um, so there hasn't been too much negative impact for us. So it was interesting, like, you know, 2020 was one of our best years because everybody was stuck at home and, um, you know, cooking. and so, you know, barbecue stuff like was flying off the shelves. And then, you know, 21 and 22 were a little bit more challenging, almost as if like people bought stuff in 20 and then they were like, I don't need it in 21 and 22. I already got it. Right. So we saw a decline in revenue in, you know, 21 and 22. Um, but this year we're actually up compared to last year. So, you know, I don't know. I mean, I, I see some of that sort of stuff, but it hasn't necessarily been affecting us. We don't see it. I don't see it in the data. It's not clear to us. If we go look at, you know, accounts that we've been managing for, you know, over 12 months um, and, and take a look at the historical total sales or even like, you know, any anything that would, we're not seeing like precipitous fall offs. Maybe we're seeing a little bit of decline in some markets, but it's because they're trending and there's actually more competitors coming in. So share is going away, but mm -hmm. it's not total market demand is dropping or anything like that. So, yeah. yeah. So, cool. so Devin, where are you guys at in your in your annual revenue? And I'll segue into why I'm asking is you and in and how much of that revenue is Amazon versus D to C at this point? Yeah. So we're on pace, I think, to be around like two and a half for the year. Um, yeah, we are focusing on trying to grow like Amazon UK. So like I see a lot of potential there. Um but uh, I would say probably like 90% of our revenue is still Amazon. Um, and then, yeah, we probably have like, like 7% Shopify and then maybe like 3% um, Walmart. Yeah. Walmart, three, five percent. Walmart is uh God, no matter how much advertising they do on, on TV, it's, I'm not seeing much. Uh, we have a we have quite a few clients at Walmart, and they're like, "Okay, I'm selling one, two a day, maybe." Yeah, so, I know. Um, it's funny though, because I I do think there are some categories that do really well on Walmart. I suspect that's true, and I heard Baby does well, but I don't mm -hmm. have anybody in that space, so I can't confirm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I had a one well, of my buddies was in that, and you know, they I think that one point they got almost to like a hundred thousand a month on Walmart. Uh, but then they ran out of inventory and you know so it was like i don't know it was kind of like an interesting i don't know if it was a fluke but yeah maybe it was good timing i don't know yeah yeah well the cpg companies that we work with they go to walmart will go to walmart for six months 12 months and then they don't go to walmart or they just stop paying attention to it they're just like it doesn't matter mm -hmm. And then we've got brands or CPG that are growing heavily on Amazon and they they drink the Kool-Aid on I need to diversify, which isn't wrong. I'm uh, drinking the Kool-Aid. That's not what I meant on about diversifying you should do that. But um, they think that Walmart is going to be one of those answers. And then it's not. Um, it ends up being a ton of work and a ton of effort and they get it all set up and then they're like, thud. And yeah, so it's just not there yet. They're yeah. making a lot of changes though. I'm pretty impressed with seeing the speed with which they're actually making changes. Their ad platforms changing quite a bit with a lot of updates and enhancements. And they're really trying to like start to be much more competitive from a advertising perspective and, and even storefronts. Like I think it was this week that they released storefronts um, for, sh for sellers. Yeah. I mean, it'll be interesting to see how it plays out for sure. So yeah, yeah they're about it's going to be a long yeah. game. The, the, they're about 10 years behind Amazon. I, I know that sounds extreme, right, but I think they're about 10 years. Yeah. Um, so I, I, I know Devin, you, you really nerd out on PPC. So let's just dive into it, man. So yeah. what's your, what's your um, biggest winning factor on the PPC side? Um, is there software you specifically love? Is there tools? Uh, tell me where you're at on all that. There's a million things yeah. out there. It's funny because I've kind of come full circle. Like, you know, over the years, like I've tried, you know, different um, methodologies. I've tried different softwares. Um, honestly, I kind of got like burned on software. And so I don't like it. 
Um, and now I, I basically manage with bulk files. Um, and that's kind of been my, my go-to, um, you know, it's funny cause like, again, you know, I've seen the same software we were using work really well for a lot of people. And in theory, it makes a lot of sense the, the way it works. But for us with a seasonal brand, like I feel like it, it actually kind of hurt our rankings and stuff. And that was part of, you know, what we were seeing in 21 and 22. Um, and so, you know, once we, we basically made the complete shift, uh, this past January to going, you know, bulk files and things have been going great. So, um, but you know, our approach to PVC, we like to try to keep everything, you know, one keyword per campaign. Um, and so we'll set up like a, a broad campaign and an exact campaign for most of our words. Um, there might be times where we'll, we'll group some things if it's strategic. So like an example might be, you know, if I'm targeting words related to like barbecue gifts for men around Father's Day, you know, sure, I could put, you know, a handful of those into a campaign just for ease of management. Um, but as far as like dialing in, you know, placements and bids and budgets, like personally, I think it's a lot easier to do that if you have them all isolated. Um, obviously that creates a huge mess, which is why I like to use bulk files. <laughs> There's an upper limit though. It's There's like an upper going. limit though at some point on those bulk files. That's the, that's the issue with those, right? Like we were using bulk files a couple of years ago and then we had a brand that we were starting to work with and we exceeded like 10 million row, or it was like a hundred thousand rows, uh, or something mm. absurd. And, and then with all the columns and everything, the cell count got got well above 10 million and so it just became scary frankly because it, it just took forever even even if you could open the file it just took forever to do something with it right yeah yeah luckily i haven't gotten to that but i could see that where like especially if you have you know a crazy skew count and then you know uh, yeah that's uh not something i've had to figure out yet but uh yeah we'll see yeah yeah, cool. What um, what about other strategies? I mean, I heard you had single keyword campaigns. You're using exacts and broads, right? Um, in, in a very very structured way. Um, what else are you seeing on the PPC side? Are you guys using other like promotions and things like that, like lightning deals, PEDs, or anything like that in a kind of a strategic way? Um, so I mean, we definitely like to use like product targeting. Um, I don't know. It's it's interesting to me because you know Amazon while they try to give you isolation it's funny how like on keyword ads they're showing you on product pages and then with product targeting they're showing you in keywords um and so you know to me it's like it is a little bit irritating that those can't be completely isolated but knowing that they're not we kind of use that to our advantage right so there are times where you know i could take say 20 uh 20 asins of relevant products set those up as you know single asin keyword like campaigns um and then amazon ultimately shows it up on keywords that are relevant to that product and those tend to perform better than if i was targeting some of those keywords directly um you know mm -hmm. for whatever reason the acos is lower so you know that's one thing that we we've, we've done that we like um and then you know i think it just trying to think of anything else that's been a game changer for us i mean obviously we try to use a little bit of all the placements just making sure we're getting coverage um do you do you treat your consumable products differently uh when it comes to ppc are, are you willing to accept a higher um you know a cost on their consumables yeah so uh we do that for for our stuff too and um interesting enough so like as part of my role with amazing you know we we manage ads for um you know life boost coffee and oh, so wow. basically by the way I'm a yeah it's, it's good stuff so you know we've been managing that account since march and you know one of the things that's been super effective for us is looking at our pbc from a cpa standpoint rather than an acos standpoint um and so you know what we've done is like okay you know based on like i pulled down you know 12 months of data you know analyzed in that 12 month period what's like the ltv and the number of orders on average from these people and you know from that we were like okay we're comfortable 
setting, you know, a CPA target of, of X, right? And so then when I when I'm managing these bulk files, I'm basically running the calculation on like, are we hitting that CPA target or better? And that allows us to drive way more volume in terms of customer acquisition because, you know, that CPA may be like, I don't know, 150 percent ACOS, but we're OK with it because we know that like it backs out with our our LTV numbers. Mm hmm. So you're looking so like at we, it holistically instead of just this one ad looks like it's not running well or you know it's not you have to you're looking at the entire picture the ltv factor is there a math formula that you put together to successfully calculate ltv and a cost because i've heard a few versions of that have you figured anything yeah. out so from an ltv standpoint basically what i did was i i downloaded the transaction reports for mm -hmm. every single month for 12 months i put them into a spreadsheet and then I just ran a pivot table on that Amazon, you know, unique email to kind yep. of figure it out. So that right way it's through, like, right through. <laughs> yeah. So then it's basically yeah. like, okay, each of these customers, you know, their total revenue over 12 months was this and then calculate the average of that. And then, you know, do a count as well. So like how many orders on average are people placing? Um, and so, so then you know that one order is like 1.15, 1 1.2. 1 value or 1.3 and then you calculate that in your a cost um well i'm not even worrying about the acos that's the thing okay. so basically what i'm doing is i'm taking like you know the ad spin divided by the orders and calculating a cpa so it's literally like i don't care what the acos is as long as i'm staying below that cpa so we can be way more aggressive mm -hmm. and well, that's, yeah that's smart, i mean we've, we've gone from about we basically increased their monthly revenue by like 50% since March. That's incredible. So that's freaking you awesome. Might, you might dig this, Devin. So that same data, that's this is the uh, Amazon fulfilled orders report, I think it is, is the one that gives you the email address. I, I may have that wrong, mm -hmm. but we looked at that data. We built a prototype of this, and now we have a tool for it. Um, and what we looked at, we didn't, I didn't do the CPA calculation, but that's now going to be on the roadmap. Um, because that like actually looking at that, we just been doing LTV, like what's just the lifetime value, but we didn't do the flip side to that. You know, what's the total acquisition mm -hmm. costs over that same same time period? Um, the thing that I thought was uh, was also interesting, which which you didn't mention was we looked at um, we classify shoppers as new or existing for specific time periods like Prime Day last year. So we'll go look at all of the unique email addresses for Prime Day. And we'll, we'll, the software will do this. We'll ask ourselves, did we have a sale with them prior to Prime Day? And if not, we earned them during that Prime Day. So then that's an, a new customer, right? New customer during Prime Day. And then there's anybody who's an existing. This was the part that was fascinating. Um, newer brand people spent like 30% less during Prime Day than mm -hmm. existing. And it was substantial. Like the, the, the cart value, the AOV uh, was, was a lot higher um, wow. based on those. This is just Prime Day. When you did it for um, Turkey Five, it was like forty to forty-five percent. <laughs> so it was quite substantial to see what how existing shoppers uh, respond and react to you know brands. And every brand is going to be different with those metrics. This is just us doing like a you know kind of a quick test. But it's something that you can do with the analysis. You can go say like, is there an email address in Turkey Five from last year? And if it's not, it's a new one. If, if it is, it's an existing shopper. And then look at the AOVs and the, and the acquisition costs for those. Yeah. Oh, that's, yeah, that sounds super interesting. Well, because then what ends up happening is you can change your bundles because you know new shoppers aren't going to be interested in those, right? So you can change, you can start to affect like, okay, well, what's my strategy really going to be here? Am I going to start, what products am I putting in front of shoppers that already do business with me? And how am I going to package those to entice them so I can make more margin? And mm -hmm. so you can kind of get a little bit smarter about, you know, how do you really want to structure your catalog for those time, those peak time periods? Right. Yeah. No, that's awesome. So what's the, uh, what's the 2024 plan for uh, Gorilla Holics? What, what's your next big, uh, big pivot? Yeah. Um, so we're, we're definitely focused on adding more consumables um and then my goal is to maybe add a couple more accessories 
like ahead of the the summer season and next winter season um kind of a, an interesting like market you know uh like caveat or whatever that i noticed so last christmas um you know like we sell some of those you know meat shredding claws and you know they're one that does pretty well around the holidays because it's you know super giftable makes a stocking stuff or whatever and when i you know i always kind of look at like the um you know the best sellers um like top 100 or whatever during you know during season during the holidays just to kind of see like what things are trending yeah and interestingly enough like last um last christmas season there was this product that was you know meat shredding claws and they called them santa claus it was it was a brand new listing like literally you you know maybe had 30 reviews so it was like they had launched it right ahead of the holidays and it was selling like a ridiculous amount of volume for being a brand new product. And so what I kind of realized from that was like, it doesn't really make sense. You know, if you sell something seasonal, you're kind of fighting against the season. If you try to launch it in the off season versus launching it right before the season and kind of riding, you know, the growth wave there. And so that made me think about, okay, like going forward, let's make our plan like, okay, we'll launch, you know, one or two new products ahead of barbecue season. And then we'll launch, you know, one or two new products ahead of, you know, holiday season and just kind of plan it that way. Um, and so what do you yeah. think yourself, Kevin, just for the launch people out there, what, what would be the ideal timeline for a listing to go live to the, to the peak of that season? To allow um, it to occur and get reviews. Yeah. I mean, I do think you want to give yourself like a few weeks on the front end of it. So, you know, for example, like you obviously for, for barbecue, June is, you know, the beginning of June before Father's Day is huge. So, you know, I would definitely want that skew to go live probably in, in May, ideally. Um, and then that way it's kind of like, yeah, and obviously you want to leverage the assets that you have, right? So like for us, we can send an email to our email list. You know, we can do those types of things to try to help, you know, juice it up. Um, but obviously you're going to come in with PVC as well. Um, but, you know, that would be my approach would be to launch it in May, ride that wave, and then kind of, you know, peak out with like the Father's Day, like buying frenzy or whatever. So Yeah, because I've noticed that with a really good listing these days, you have 25 reviews and you're hitting the timing right you're fine mm -hmm. you know and do, do you guys take advantage of vine i think it's a great program yep yeah we usually do um you know we always recommend if people have brand registry to do vine like to me it's it's silly not to right because it's like as long as you have a good product it's a great way to you know get close to 30 reviews you know max it out take advantage of it um yeah you know, we have seen you know some vine reviewers are a little critical when it comes to your pricing and things like that and it's like you literally got this thing for free why are you even commenting on price um but i don't know i think they just look for something you know to make their reviews seem more objective versus giving everything a five star uh so that's i mean that's one thing you kind of got to deal with but usually it's like you're getting four and five star reviews with vine and to me, it's a great way to jumpstart things. A hundred percent agree with you. And th there are a few Karens and, you know, and there are a few uh, people who probably wish they could have been like a movie critic or something because they're yeah. like overly critical of a <laughs> pair of tongs. <laughs> yeah. <But> yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, uh, thanks for joining us, man. This has really been helpful and I really appreciate you being open about your brand, letting people see it. Um, because it's inspiring for others. And at the same time, it also illuminates some of the unique challenges that you have. And not everybody has the perfect brand. Not everyone has the perfect store. Everyone has their challenges. Everyone has margin problems. Everyone has PPC, mar PPC cost problems. So I'm just trying yeah. to make that really aware to everybody. What I like the most too, Devin, in hearing your answers to some of the, the things that we're talking through here today is that nothing you're sharing is like complex nothing you're sharing is like over the head of the listener right and and they need to hear it because it's like you know the environment's just changing constantly um so thanks thanks for sharing all those insights yeah yeah 
Yeah, I mean, I think everybody always wants to learn, you know, the the sexy hacks or whatever, but it really is, you know, the the fundamentals that do most of the heavy lifting for you. So. Yep, 100%. it's the boring, it's boring stuff. Let's be honest. It's the making sure the product testing is really good. The product's like you really like make sure the packaging is is solid. Uh, making sure that it, the landed cost is actually going to be profitable, and that stuff takes time. And a lot of it's ninety percent preparation, ten percent execution. It's crazy. Definitely. Yep. Yeah. Well, thanks a lot, man. Uh, enjoy the remainder of your summer over in Missouri, and uh, uh, we'll talk again soon, buddy. Yeah. Hey, Devin. Yeah. Thanks a lot, man. Just want to say that.